If you are a guest with us this morning, we want to uh, once again welcome you. We have been going through a study out of the book of Romans, and uh, we have just completed, uh, since last week, chapters 1 through 4. And uh, we saw how uh, these chapters, they primarily focus on the gospel, the good news, and what is called the doctrine of of justification, which we just looked at last Sunday. And we saw how Christians are justified by faith, not by works. And in chapter 4, it exclusively focuses on the life of Abraham and the life of faith that he lived in his relationship with God. And so we learned some very profound and important things when it comes to faith in the life of the believer. First of all, we saw based upon Abraham's life that faith is essential. It is essential to our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, faith is the starting point uh, to our relationship with God. We also saw that faith is meant to be expressed. It shouldn't be something that people have to wonder uh, about, but we have actually been called to express our faith through both our lips as well as our lives. Then we saw that faith is also something that can and should be explained. Every uh, Christian, every follower of Christ should be able to explain uh, why they believe and what they believe believe and who they believe in. And then the final thing that we saw uh, regarding Abraham that uh, applies to our life is uh, we, we see that Abraham's life was examined by the Apostle Paul. And in the same way, our lives are also being examined to everyone, by everyone who knows uh, that we proclaim to be a Christian. And so uh, last week we, we focused on this uh, topic, this principle, this law of faith within the kingdom of God. Now that brings us to this morning to Ro Romans chapter 5. And so if you have not turned there yet, I would encourage you to do so. If you're not real familiar with the Bible, Romans is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and we'll be looking at chapter 5, the first five verses, and uh, I'm going to just go ahead and read those verses, and then we will uh, backtrack and uh, make a comment on them as uh, we go along. Verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven in character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so in, in these five verses this morning we, we discover at least four things and four things that we'll be focusing on today. First of all we discover that peace is made possible with God. The second thing is that we have a profound access uh, that we have to God. The third thing that we are going to see is our perspective regarding our future with God. And then finally, we're going to see that there is purpose in our pain as we walk with God. Now, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. 
25 is the very last verse in Romans chapter 4. It really serves as a springboard for Romans chapter 5. The very last word of Romans chapter 4 is the word justification. And justification, as we've already seen, is more than forgiveness. In forgiveness, God says you can go. You have been set free from judgment. I have pardoned you. Whereas in justification, God says you can come. You see, justification is an invitation into God's kingdom of love. And justification is how we are made right with God. We saw last week that justification is a gift that comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so that brings us to the first point that I want to highlight today when it comes to being justified by faith as a believer in Christ. And the first benefit that we see is that we have peace with God. Again, verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, here it is, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this peace that Paul speaks of, we need to understand, is more than a feeling. It is a fact. It is a legal declaration that is made in the courts of heaven. And notice, this is only made possible through the person of Jesus Christ. Not, not religion, not going to, to church, not being a good person, uh, not by the works of the law. No. No through Christ alone. And of course we uh, know that one of the titles that is given to Jesus in the scriptures is the Prince of what? Peace, the Prince of Peace. That famous messianic uh, passage out of the book of Isaiah where his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, Almighty God, Everlasting Father. And so, peace, the Prince of Peace, is a title that Scripture has appointed to Jesus. And so, guys, here's how it works. Please listen. The Christian can have the peace of God because through faith we are at peace with God. Let me say that again. The Christian can have the peace of God because we are at peace with God. And, and so check this out. Jesus as Savior brings peace with God. Jesus as Lord brings the peace of God. And so this is what happened. Through the cross a peace treaty was signed. And Paul tells us that peace comes, get this, peace comes when grace and faith unite. That mixture, faith and grace, those ingredients is what gives birth to peace in the life of the believer. And being at peace with God and experiencing the peace of God is one of the greatest benefits that a person could possibly experience. I mean, in a world of, of so much unrest... In a world of so much turmoil and war and, and, and hatred and, and, and cruelty and a lack of peace, Jesus came to earth and he said to us these words, peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, <laughs> give I to you. You, you see, it is a peace that the world does not understand. It's a peace that the world cannot experience because it is a peace that comes from above. It comes from the person of Jesus Christ. And he tells us specifically, I give it to you. You see, peace is a gift that comes 
to us from the person of Jesus Christ. And so I, I, I love Romans chapter 5. I, I, I love uh, the entire chapter. Verses 1 and 2 uh, are, are especially powerful to me because verse 1 speaks of peace. But notice when we read verse 2 speaks of grace, hope, and glory. Again, grace, hope, and glory. You might want to circle or underline those words in your Bible. You're permitted to do so. And all of these things, get this, all of these things are the fruit of justification, of being justified by faith. And, and as you think of it, really what power these words carry with them. Think about it. Think, think about how profound these words are. Peace. Some of you need peace today as you're listening to this message. Peace. Grace. Oh, don't we all need grace? Hope. Some listening this morning desperately need hope to be revived in your life. Glory. You see, all of these things are not discovered or experienced in a vacuum. These things are what the gospel brings. The gospel brings peace. The gospel brings grace. The gospel brings hope. The gospel brings glory. As a matter of fact, you cannot separate the gospel from the glory of God. When the angel appeared to the shepherds in the field, what was the very first thing he said? Glory to God in the highest. You see, it all is tied together and it all works together. And notice that Paul uses a phrase here in verse 2 and that he says, through whom we have obtained. In other words, this is something that belongs to us. We have obtained, here it is, our introduction by faith. Now, this word introduction, it's, a, it's an important word because it speaks of access. It speaks of having access to something. So through faith, we are given access to God's grace. The word access is used of someone who brings another into someone else's presence. And so simply put, Jesus brings us into the presence of God. Faith brings us into the presence of grace. And this word access, especially back in the day that Paul is writing, it was a profound word. Remember he's writing to the, the Romans, the Roman believers. And it's very profound because within the Roman culture, the various gods, and there were many, that they worship, they were mostly gods, small g, that were angry and that were aloof. And these false gods were to be placated and they were to be applauded, but they were never to be approached. Approaching or having access to God was beyond their thinking. And that's why... In the book of Hebrews, it's so wonderful <laughs> where the, the author of Hebrews tells us, Therefore, then, let us draw near to the throne room of grace so that we might find grace and help in time of need. And this was so vividly demonstrated at the point that Jesus died upon the cross. You might remember that something very strategic happened, and that is the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, signifying that there is no longer a wall of separation between God and man. That through the cross, God removed the veil and that we all have full access to God and that through the cross we can approach the Father. Through the cross we can have access to the Father. Through the cross Paul tells us that it is in this truth of having access that notice in verse 2 he says that we now stand. 
You see, before the cross, we were fallen. After the cross, we stand. And guys, th this word stand is, is seen in both the Old and New Testament. But, but when Paul says we stand, it means this. It means that salvation is God's part. Salvation or standing is our part. Again, salvation is God's part, but standing is our part. And so, as we stand, we see that our faith should be firm. Our faith should be immovable. Our faith should be something that we are sure of, that we stand firm in, and that we are steadfast in as well. And so, we see here... In verse 1, that, that through Christ we have peace with God. We see in verse 2 that we have a profound access to God through the person of Jesus Christ. And then the third thing that we see is in the last part of verse 2. And that is we see uh, our perspective of our future with God. A perspective of our future with God. Again, verse 2, it says, Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand here it is and we exult in the hope of the glory of God there's that phrase again the glory of God and so Paul he's telling us that we rejoice we, we uh, exult in hope of the glory of God and in the glory of God you see, our hope, in part, is founded on the glory of God, as I shared earlier. It, it, it's, it, it's experienced by bringing Him glory, by seeing His glory, by experiencing His glory, by telling of His glory. And get this, one day, we will actually be dwelling in His glory. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. Amen? You see, that's what it's all pointing to, where we're dwelling in the midst of the glory of God. And so that is the perspective that Paul wants us to have. And, and, and he uses this word hope. Hope speaks of expectation. It speaks of confidence. And it speaks of security. Could we work a bit on getting that buzz out of the speaker, guys? Again, hope. It speaks of expectation, confidence, and security. Loved ones, out of all the people on the face of the earth, it is the Christian, listen, who has reason and cause to hope. Because our confidence isn't in false gods. Our confidence isn't in man. And so here's the deal. Just as we can live in peace, we should also be living in hope. Those things should never be absent from our lives. Peace and hope should be the distinguishing marks in the life of the believer. And peace and hope are benefits of the gospel at work in our lives. And everyone said both amen and thank you. And so... Paul is providing for us th this understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He's saying, guys, you can have peace. You can also <laughs> have grace and, and, and hope and glory. And, and he's saying to each and every one of us that, that because of Jesus we also have a profound access to God that no one else in the world has. And then we saw that not only do we have this profound access, He gives us a perspective of our future with God. That one day it's going to be a glorious thing. 
that we will be dwelling in the midst of His glory for all eternity. And then the fourth and the final thing that he points out here is we discover that there is purpose in pain while walking with God. There is a purpose in pain while walking with God. Notice in verses 3 through 5. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so what we discover here is that because of the past, that is the cross, we have peace with God. In the present, we have access to God. And in the future, we will dwell in the glory of God. But what about all the dark and the difficult times we go through in this life? Well, Paul addresses that. And he addresses it very powerfully. It's very profound what he says because we discover here that there is purpose in our pain. Again, there is purpose in our pain. And we also know that Jesus promised us that we would experience tribulation. And oftentimes, we think that we should never have trials or tests here on earth. Don't we? That we're somehow entitled and therefore we should escape all problems. We should escape all testing. We should escape all trials and tribulation. We feel that each day should be filled with rainbows and cotton candy and our own pet unicorn. You know, that's how I want my Christian life to be. But someone once said, when painting the Christian life, you have to include the dark colors. You know how true that is. And we have to realize that there is a purpose in our pain. But notice something very significant, very strategic, and that is Paul uses the word tribulations. Not tribulation, tribulations, plural. It speaks of numerous difficulties that we come that will come into our lives. Now the English word tribulation it comes from the Latin word tribulum. And a tribulum was a piece of wood that had uh, uh, spikes nailed into it. It was a Roman tool that was used to separate the wheat from the chaff in the threshing process. And so Paul is speaking of tribulations as a refining process in which God removes that which is unhealthy and unneeded from our lives. And the word tribulation in the Greek, it can actually be translated a pressing down. A pressing down. It speaks of pressure that is being applied to our lives. And so if you could picture a potter and the clay. Now, a potter takes that clay, <laughs> and he shapes it, and he molds it, and he, he, he puts pressure on it, and pressure is absolutely essential for the potter to form the clay into the image that he or she desires. And so, in the book of Acts, we're told, through much tribulation, in other words, through a lot of pressure coming upon you, when God and life is pressing in on you, through much tribulation, you will enter the kingdom of God. 
In other words, the kingdom of God is God's will, God's rule, and God's reign will be established in our lives. And so Paul is painting a picture of how God uses trials and tribulations to remove the shaft from our lives and to form and fashion us into his likeness. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he tells us that there are or at least three things tribulation produces. There are at least three things that happen or occur when God presses in on us to shape us into his likeness and into his image where we really begin to be shaped in a way that we develop his heart and, and his mind. And the first thing that he says here is perseverance. Notice again and not only this, but we exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Talked about this a bit last week. Perseverance has been described as a long obedience in the same direction. I like that. I like to define perseverance as faith's fortitude. It reflects a faith that sustains us through thick and thin. Now, another example or illustration that Paul gives is that our journey of faith is likened to a race. And the race that Paul is describing is more like a marathon, not a 50-yard dash, and then we're all through and we receive our trophy, whatever that might be. No, he's talking about a marathon. And so our Christian journey requires endurance. It requires perseverance. It requires us to have bifocal vision where we can see that which is close up as well as that which is far away. It was Winston Churchill who said it best during the height of World War II where England was being bombed on a daily basis. Rubble was in the streets. People were dying. And he said this, never, ever, ever, ever give in or give up. up. He went on to say, continuous effort, think of those words, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. Loved ones, simply put, we have to be long distance runners in this race that we're involved in. Sometimes we give up too soon. Sometimes we give up too early. Sometimes the reason why we give up too soon or too early is because we lack faith. Remember, this is all about faith, guys. And so where our faith wanes, so too our relationship with God wanes. And so Paul is encouraging us to understand that the hardship that you're going through right now the tests that you're going through right now, the difficulties, this dark season that you're walking through, that there is a purpose in your pain. And part of the purpose is that God wants to teach you perseverance. The next thing that he says about trials tribulation that it gives birth to perseverance and notice perseverance gives birth to proven character you see God doesn't call us to be characters he wants us to have proven character and so when he says proven character would you think of a metal that has been tested or proved where it has become a finished product. And this word actually speaks of a proof of genuineness and something that is trustworthy. 
I love what Job had to say. He went through a lot of tribulations. He said in Job 23.10, But he that is God knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And that's the picture that Paul is wanting us to see here. He wants us to have proven character. He wants us after being tried by fire to come forth like gold. On TV there's some of these homesteader shows. I like to watch them every once in a while. They intrigue me, these people that live off the land and just survive with their own skills and things that they have developed and wisdom that they have gained over the, the, the years. They have forsaken the comforts of, uh, uh, of culture and modern man, and they've chosen to live out in the, the, the wilderness and, and survive on their own. And in one of these homesteader shows, there's one of the, the, the guys in the show, he lives, he and his family live in Arkansas. And what he does uh, for a living is that he makes knives. And, and he makes very excellent and expensive knives. And this one show that I watched of this guy, he would go deep into the caves, crawling through these small spaces with the intention of finding his own Arkansas ore. And on this one show, he wanted to, to gather 200 pounds, I think it was, of Arkansas uh, ore. Now, Pitcher, carrying that, dragging that, he had his son with him, through a cave. As you're going into the deep recesses to find this valuable ore. And so he got his 200 pounds of, of ore and he brought them back and he took a piece of ore and he put it in a kiln. And the thing with this kiln is that in order to produce a proven uh, piece of metal, it has to be at exactly the right temperature. Too high and it will destroy the work. Too low and it will not produce its desired effects. So it has to be the right temperature. It also has to involve the right timing. You can't take it out too soon or it's not going to be a proven work. And you can't leave it in too long or it's just going to melt and it's not going to have any effectiveness at all. And this guy, uh, I'm watching him do this, and it took him not one time to put the ore through the kiln, but a number of times, and he was getting frustrated when it wasn't working, but a number of times going through the fire and being tested before the metal become trustworthy. I remember one time he thought he had got this metal to, to, to be able to be formed into a knife and he was so proud and, and yet as it cooled off he noticed that there was a crack right down the middle of the knife. And guys, that's what tribulation does. Tribulation exposes the cracks in our lives. And perhaps you find yourself in the fire today. Perhaps you feel like the Lord has put you in the furnace. Please know, listen, please know that once the fire has produced its desired results, you will become stronger and you will become purer and you will become better and you will become more useful to the master and his plan and purpose for your life. But if you reject the fire, you're rejecting the very thing that God wants to use to develop proven character within your life. And so my exhortation to us all is let the fire do what it is designed to do. Now... He says tribulations give birth to perseverance and perseverance pr proven character. And then the last thing that he speaks about 
is hope. That proven character gives birth to hope. And we talked about hope earlier, but Paul, he brings it up again because it's so important. And I was thinking, you know, there are a lot of things that we can live without, but hope isn't one of them. And that's why hope is one of the greatest themes in the Bible. All throughout its pages, God gives us cause and reason to hope. It's mentioned 129 times in Scripture. And guys, hear this. It's the reason why Jesus is so appealing, because Jesus offers hope to a hopeless world. And hope for the Christian is different than hope in the world, just like peace for the Christian is different than peace that is in the world. The worldly kind of hope is more of a wish. Well, well, I hope it will work out, right? How many times have we heard that? And for the non-Christian, it is uncertain. But for the Christian, hope is sure. We're told in Romans 8, 28, we'll get there in a while. For God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You see, that's something that we can have confidence in and find security in. Hope is the confidence in the faithfulness and the character of God. Again, faith or hope is confidence in the faithfulness and character of God. Hope is a manifestation of faith in the life of the believer. As a matter of fact, the more you are filled with faith, the more you will also be filled with hope, you see. For the Christian, our hope is in God and God alone. For the non-Christian, their hope is in things other than God. I hope it works out. I wish it works out. Maybe this will come through or maybe. It, it's a maybe and a wishing. But you see, our hope is fixed and certain and secure because our hope is in God himself. And so, as we close, let's remember some things this morning. Let's remember that peace is ours as Christians. Let's remember that grace is ours. Let's remember that hope is ours. You see, we've had this introduction. We have obtained these things. And all these things bring glory to God, the one and the only one who is faithful and true. Would you all stand with me? And let's close with this prayer. <laughs> Let's pray this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Father God, we thank you for the gifts of peace, grace, hope, and glory. Thank you for the profound access we have in approaching you. Thank you for the preferred future we can hope in. And thank you that there is purpose in the pain we must go through as we are tested and tried for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the prayer team, the elders, to come forward. And as they do, we're going to close in a song. And I want to encourage you, if you need prayer for anything, <laughs> to come and let these uh, prayer servants pray with you and for you and over you. And perhaps something that was said today struck a chord in your heart. Maybe, maybe you find yourself uh, lacking peace. Maybe you find yourself lacking grace, lacking hope. Maybe you're not seeing the glory of God, those small glimpses that God allows us to see here on earth. If those things are lacking in your life, 
They're because we are not through faith appropriating the gospel message. Again, our introduction, we have access to these things. And perhaps you need prayer to just change your perspective and allow the grace of God to come alive, the hope of God, the peace of God to come alive in your life once again. And should you be here and you've never given your life to Jesus, He loves you so much. We read that He came. He, he, he died for us so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. We could be justified through faith in Him. He wants to give us this future and a hope. He wants us to be filled with His Holy Spirit. And if you have never made that step of faith, I want to encourage you to do so today. Just come forward and someone would love to pray with you and pray for you and share with you how you can continue on in this journey of faith. God loves you so much. In Jesus' name.
situation, God, because your victory looks so much different than what we expect. And like, God, we, we do think that victory looks like cotton candy and unicorns and all that stuff. Like, it just looks like good times, God, but your victory is so much deeper, God. It's so much better. Lord, your goodness is so much better than the goodness that we think we want or need. God, we just, we thank you that you make beauty for ashes, God, that you pull us through hard times, God, and that you do have something beautiful on the other side, Lord. That's that's the strength we have in you, God, is just knowing that through all that, God, we already have victory. We just thank you, Jesus. We thank you for how good you are. We pray that you continue to reveal your goodness to us and show us who you are. Thank you, Father. We just love revelation of you. Teach us throughout this next week, and you know, the next these 12 days for the Daniel fast, Lord, and the people who are participating, God, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to us, Jesus. You would, um, I don't know, just spark that desire for you in our hearts, God. Yes. Just awaken us, Lord, to your glory and to your goodness, Lord, and just the reality of every day that you're with us and you're doing things, Lord, and just this bigger narrative, God, than just our lives. Thank you, Father. Draw us close to you this week, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe there's a seniors taking college students out. Yes, there's still time. Still time. Make arrangements now. Find someone. <laughs>